give me a couple of it. Well, welcome to the third of four segments on the trip that Amy Zalisco and I took uh, from mid-December, about December 20th, to about January 13th, uh, ending January 2013th of 2020. I guess you can see some of the dates up here. Uh, this leg of the adventure takes us on the South Island now from our arrival at Picton on this sort of meandering route, making the way to Queenston and then eventually over to Dunedin. Uh, I'll end this segment by talking about the field trip to see the endangered species of skink in a protected area. Thanks for bearing with us, by the way. I guess you must be pretty interested in this. Maybe that means you aren't. Here's a um, matching up of a satellite image of the South Island of New Zealand. So I tried to get them so they're pretty comparable. Picton here on the right, and then Picton uh, somewhere over here on the left, <clears throat> somewhere in this cloud cover, I think. Um, what we did after staying a night in Picton was traveled along through a really beautiful northern part of the island, the South Island, and made our way eventually over here to Westport, where we spent New Year's Eve and uh, the last evening then of the year 2019. What you can see in this satellite view is really the snowy capped mountains, this backbone going through that they call the Southern Alps. Here in New Zealand, they call this the Southern Alps. And as I mentioned to you before, with predominant winds coming from the west, uh, the moist winds are coming from the west and then they hit this mountain range and the clouds rise and drop their moisture. And so there's so much moisture dropped on the west side of these southern Alps that it creates this temperate rainforest area. And so this is showing you some of the extent of the temperate rainforest. This would be a, in a future an area that I'd like to go down and spend more time in New Zealand, uh, the, the most southern parts of the southern island. But it's pretty cool down here, even in the summertime. So leaving Picton, this is what some of those surrounding landscapes look like. I had to climb a trail to get to this spot and to take a look. Um, pretty big areas, but again, uh, generally undeveloped. Uh, there is boating going on and this particular, this is, I think, Governor's Bay, uh, where people often anchor right here. It's a pretty beach. Um, temperatures, generally speaking, were in the 70s down to the 50s, maybe even 40s. On the, in the Dunedin region, which is the southernmost part where we had our meeting, uh, temperatures were quite breezy. It was very breezy, and temperatures in the 50s and 60s, Fahrenheit. So it, it wasn't a real warm time. You see all the beaches, and I was wondering when do people really swim. Uh, we were there on the first day of summer, which was pretty neat. Uh, we were also on the first day of summer on the other uh, part of the globe, up in Iceland. So it was neat to be in the first day of summer in Iceland and then the first day of summer in New Zealand. Here are uh, some of the cities that are surrounding this area. Uh, this is a very tidal inlet, and this is low tide. So this is the re revealing some of the shoreline at low tide. <clears throat> Lots of streams. Uh, so this is now a mountainous region. So an awful lot of meltwater making its way down. So very, very cold streams, but make for just some beautiful landscapes. And while we stopped at one place just to pull over, and to look around, uh, we're just sitting around. We had been warned about this, but out of the grasses emerges this bird, which they call a wicca. So remember the weta or wida that was the grasshopper looking thing. This is the weka. Uh, they called them wiccas. And we pulled over and I took these pictures of this guy who comes right up to you. I'm told that they will steal silverware and food from campers and you really have to watch for them. It really is about the size of a chicken and they talk about these being forest chickens. We had some that were around a bed and breakfast that we were at. It was a little cottage and these uh, little wekas would come around and see if you had any scraps. 
Uh, but then, it, interestingly, if so, if there's anything that scares them, they run right back in the grasses and hide. Um, so it's kind of neat. New Zealand has implemented a new fee if you want to fly in, a tourist fee. It's not much, maybe 20 bucks. And they're collecting up these tourist fees and they're building more and more trails and other accommodations for people who are interested in seeing nature. And so here's a nice suspension bridge that Amy's on. Uh, this was the beginning of a new trail they had built. Uh, and it's really, really neat. We didn't spend much time on these trails, but uh, they're really well-kept trails. And an awful lot of people we met were staying in, in little campers. And there are places, not a lot, but places where you can pull over with a camper and then they spend their days hiking trails. Amy was quite proud because she uh, doesn't like heights, and yet she went up on the swing bridge. Here now, uh, we're east of the mountains, but looking west. So this is the clouds that are rising as they move towards us. They're rising up the mountains, and then a little bit tipping over the ridge on the top. It was just really neat to see, to see the clouds. So again, winds coming from the west. Uh, we're in this region right here. Um, actually, I think this all was occurring about right here as we were crossing these mountains. So all the moist winds are moving over and then with the mountains, the clouds rise and that's cooler and that causes them to drop their moisture and create the temperate rainforest. So here we see that the clouds peeking over the mountain as they blow over and he's responsible for this ecosystem, the temperate rainforest. I just thought it was really neat. So this is what you get. You get a temperate rainforest, you get to drive through, and this is a lot of the diversity. You know, if you've been paying attention, you'll recognize this as the New Zealand Christmas tree. Here, not stranded on a volcanic island, Rangitoto, that I told you about in the first segment, but here now on the South Island, embedded within a natural forest, temperate rainforest. And this is what it looked like. You're driving around through this. So I highly recommend if people want to think about taking a trip to New Zealand um, to really rent a car, get used to driving on the left side of the road, and enjoy this kind of scenery. It's beautiful. So we made our way to Westport. Again, this was on December 31st uh, for the new year. And uh, the location again is right there at that tip. We talked to some of the local people we were staying with, and I said, you know, about being a zoologist, and he said, oh, you got to come down to this particular beach. And the reason is, is that there's a seal colony right here at the tip of this peninsula, and you walk along the beach, and of course, at low tide here, there's lots of different things to look for. Um, and here is the tip of the peninsula where there's a seal colony. And notice the color of the sky. This is due to all the forest fires and all the smoke that's in the atmosphere. And this is part of the seal colony we were watching just before sunset. And if you're really good, you'll look around in this picture and spot a few baby seals, maybe even notice a mother seal. Uh, I want to help you out. Um, so there's a baby seal right there. It was kind of neat because the sun was getting ready to go down and all the little babies had been down here on the shoreline. And so they were clamoring all around trying to wait, make their way back to mom. So there's one baby there, and there's another baby there, and another baby there. Of course, we've got these that are really close to us. Um, we could hear them calling from in these crevices down here. Um, and we were up on a platform. Of course, you don't disturb these seals. You leave them alone. This is a protected area. And here we are watching the sunset. And I already made the point that this really odd looking sun was due to all the smoke coming over from the forest fires in Australia. Next day, we made our, our way a little farther down. Um, here, uh, it wasn't a very long trip. Uh, Punakaki is a park, or one of their new national parks, very protected, and they also are protecting the marine area here. And one of the things I'm going to show you is some really unusual geology along this coastline. 
there's a lot of sedimentary rock here and this rock has risen up with these plate tectonics that have created the mountains and there's exposure of some very odd rocks. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this area. Here we pulled off the side of the road because I just couldn't take it anymore and I had to stand and look around and you can spot the Christmas trees all around, the ones that are in blossom. Here's some more of those Christmas trees but just it really looks quite tropical. It's a temperate rainforest. Here uh, you stop and there's trails that go off just to the side to show you some of the ecosystems and they have nice signs on them. And I took some of these pictures because if you just looked at the top of the canopy, you could be led to believe that everything looked like that. Um, and so as we made our way now again towards the shoreline, there are different grades of ecosystems as you approach the ocean shore. And this was one that had favored some of these grasses. Some of the other things just growing on trees, just really beautiful lush plants because there's lots of moisture. Right near the shoreline, uh, there were these plants called New Zealand flax. And here it was, it looked like somebody had a crop, but it wasn't. Um, and so these very long leaves, these flax leaves, have these very tough fibers in them. And so the Maori would use these plants as a source of fiber and they would take the leaves in a very sustainable way so they wouldn't take all the leaves. Um, and those were good practices that allow them to have then a, a lifelong supply of fiber that then they could weave into all sorts of materials. Here are just some of the other vegetation that we saw on our trip. Just beautiful stuff. And so here's the shoreline that you're going to see some real dramatic stuff here in a minute. Um, this is sedimentary rock. This is eroding. And way just beyond this corner up here is a part of the National Park, and I want to tell you about it. But this was a beautiful area as well. So it's called Pancake Rocks, and this is sedimentary rocks, rather thin layers, and they're just stratified over, gosh, 100 meters at least coming out of the water. And so this is what you see. Now over here, people, for a size perspective, and what you're seeing, if you look kind of closely here, is layer after layer after layer of highly eroded rock. And so this shows you a little bit better. Some of the rock has fallen and broken off, so the angle has changed. But the natural angle is horizontal. The ocean is washing in and eroding out, so there's ocean water coming in right around here. They have trails that you walk along. So you can go along and see this. You aren't out walking on these rocks. You wouldn't want to do that. It could break off and you could die easily. <clears throat> Here looking, you can pause this to look a little bit more, but water accumulating in some of these spots. And of course, during storms, there would be a lot of wave action. Here's one of the trails we were walking on, just to show you a little bit of a land bridge here um, and making your way. And this was a, a big football field size area that was surging with every wave. So the water level here would rise sometimes up to this level and then drop back down. Huge erosion of the shoreline. Here we're seeing as it tapers off um, up here, this is the road that you're driving along. Um, here we made our way down to a beach where some of that rock was sticking out. You can see how it creates these ledges, really dramatic kinds of places. On the other side of the road, away from the ocean, are traces of the historical erosion, and that is some of these caves that have washed out. Amy and I knew in advance going down there, I'd done a lot of research to try to be as best prepared as I could, so we brought torches. Now, you might know them as flashlights, but when you're down in New Zealand or even in England, they'll call them a torch. And so we brought flashlights and we got to probe into these caves very, very deeply. Uh, just about everybody we met was using the light off of their iPhone or smartphone, and that was more limited. Uh, our flashlights allowed us to explore a lot more deeply. But of course, your vision is limited when you're in these environments, and you're reaching out to kind of touch the walls. And, and when you reach out like that, why, lo and behold, you can snap off the tip of your finger, or at least the bone. And so I managed to stick my finger out to touch one of the walls and the tip of my finger, that little flange, uh, broke. And so here uh, you can see a picture I took showing you the swollen size of my pinky on my left finger compared to my right. Um, and this is the fracture zone. 
and here it is June and the thing hasn't totally healed up. It's still a little bit. I didn't really splint it. There's not much to do. This is usually where you go to a hospital and they say to you, yep, it's broke. And then uh, what we're going to do? Well, pretty much, you know, be careful with it. Um, so I didn't. Uh, here I am back at our bed and breakfast. This is where I took the first picture of the whole slideshow. And I'm nursing my little broken finger uh, with a spot of tea. As you went through New Zealand, wherever you were, if you arrived in your room and there was a little refrigerator uh, and you opened up the fridge, there would always be a fresh bottle of milk, a small bottle of milk. And it wasn't a carton. It was always a little plastic bottle of milk. And so at one point, it's in Queenston, uh, at the bed and breakfast, I was talking to the owner. And I said, so uh, I said, I, I've noticed <coughs> the whole way along our trip that every time we come into a room, there's a bottle of milk. And he's, he looked at me so matter-of-factly. That was what impressed me. And, and I said, so what's the milk for? And he said, well, what if you want tea? <laughs> and I said, well, okay, or what if I want beer? Um, so I understood that if, you know, if you, if you come in, they expect that you should be able, you apparently have a right to a spot of tea. And of course you have to have milk ready and waiting for you. So here we were on the little balcony off of our room, uh, looking off to the western shoreline of the South Island. And that's the picture that I started with, a cropped version of this, uh, so that you can see the balcony. And then when the person makes the way down here, uh, to go out onto their little nestled retreat out here. And here's just a few other pictures uh, of that same area. Through the evening, this was a, uh, the, that night was a little rainy. Um, here, still that smoky kind of sunset that we saw. Uh, and I want to say that our, our luck continued in our travels in which uh, we had no day out of 26 days running around New Zealand that the weather interfered with anything. Um, one day when we were driving extensively, there was a light, misty rain. But otherwise, the rains would come at night uh, and nothing prevented us. We, we didn't have any place that we couldn't see because of cloud cover, which is so common when you're in a mountainous region. So we really, really felt fortunate. Here, uh, uh, um, next night down the road on the west side again of the South Island, so you can see these highly eroded cliffs. Um, you just kind of, what do you want to do? And we, we pulled off to a little bit of a, a parking lot, and there was a trail that ran next to a stream. And it was probably a couple hours till sunset. We had just had dinner at a person uh, at the bed and breakfast. I said, where can you eat? She said, well, there's this touristy place that you can get pizza. She said, or if you drive 15 miles or so, and she probably would have said 10 kilometers, or not 15 miles, 15 kilometers, which is about 10 miles. Um, south, she said, you can go to this bar, and it's not much of a bar, but it's just locals. And we did, and it was a bar, and then there were sofas and uh, lounge chairs and one table with chairs, and it was just local people. And I said, uh, well, sure, of course we want to go to something that's the local people. And we had a uh, wonderful political conversation uh, with, with very, very nice people. And, of course, ate some fried seafood, fish of some sort. Came back and decided to take this trail. So we're hiking up. And as soon as we park the car and we get out, lo and behold, I look and you, you can't believe it. There's a mother goat and her baby, her kid, that's crossing this road right here. Well, goats are not native, and wild goats, uh, they want to get rid of, because goats eat lots of stuff. So when we got back to the bed and breakfast, I told the lady, and she couldn't believe it. And then she said, well, yeah, there, there could be a goat there. And she said, I'll, I'll let people know, because they go out and hunt them then, to keep the goats from becoming then a new, massive, introduced species. Anyway, we walked up this trail, and it was quiet, and for the most part, we were by ourselves until we were coming back and some people... Um, but as you'll see just from the scenery, it was just the most pleasant uh, trail and very calm and just beautiful vegetation. Um, it was just the kind of meditation place. So look at the reflection here. A little further down, and you can see one of the big Christmas trees in blossom as you're going through this valley. 
Uh, there's Amy, kind of a fun picture. It kind of looks like she's underground, but she's not a trail one under this cliff. Um, there's the Christmas tree from another angle. <clears throat> it wasn't until the next day when I drove out of the town that I realized this was the place that rented canoes. And I guess this was a common thing, the canoe up this little stream. Uh, but for us, it actually was much more peaceful walking along it. We really enjoyed it. Um, I have film that I'm not showing you. I know it's hard to believe there's things I'm not showing you. Uh, but I have film of a, a weka, so the bird, the chicken thing, that we encountered on the trail. In fact, we encountered about four of them. And then we just stood on the trail and one of them walked around us and was curious about us, but we didn't have anything to offer it. Anyway, this is some of the vegetation that we saw. The next day we headed south and we wanted to go to one of the glaciers. There were two. Franz Joseph was one um, glacier to see. And this is where you get to walk here from the shoreline through the temperate forest to get to the glacier. This was the day that was a little rainy uh, and it was kind of a nice moody day. You're, you're going along the shoreline here. Um, this is what you get a hundred miles of if you want. Uh, and it was pretty stormy, that is with the wind, and it was just a beautiful day along the shoreline. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, here's that walls of ferns that I was telling you about. Uh, so we must have had road construction or something going on. And this is where I took those pictures as we're going along on this hillside. So there's one of those fern pictures that I just love. This is one of my favorite photos of the whole trip. All right, you can pause these if you want. I'll go through them faster here. Um, so this is the landscape. This is the flat area, uh, the flat next to the ocean, and then just behind us and under either side of the mountains. Franz Joseph Glacier was much farther than down here. Uh, that was actually the name of the town uh, called Franz Joseph Glacier and the glacier right there. And there's quite a story to tell you about this glacier. Um, so here's the mountains. And at this point, Franz Gl Joseph Glacier is about right here. Uh, what we're doing, this road literally is the fault line that you might have remembered that I showed you. So with these mountains. And so as I'm going to have roads after Franz Joseph that cross, you then are crossing over from the Indo-Australian plate to the Pacific plate. So on the South Island, this is where I said the Pacific Plate is riding over. So this is Pacific Plate is riding over the Indo-Australian Plate here. It's the reverse on the North Island. So that's just kind of interesting. Anyway, you're actually going over the fault zone. Well, that fault zone runs right through the town of, of Franz Joseph Glacier right here. And I want to tell you about that. So this is the 3rd of January. And this is now we make our way to the tip of Franz Joseph Glacier right here. And this is a park map. You park in here, and these are different trails that you can take. And all of this is temperate rainforest, because this is just the upslopes from the ocean behind you. And we can walk up, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of the glacial valley up here from this point, Sentinel Rock. And then uh, Amy and I walked all the way up as far as you can go to the tip of the glacier. Here's the trail. So you're going through, uh, again, temperate rainforest here. You can see the clouds that are pretty low, dropping all sorts of moisture. And oh my goodness, what a just a beautiful area. Uh, when you're walking through, it's important not only to look up, but also look down. And I'll show you some of the vegetation around our feet. Just really interesting. These are little guys, um, probably no more than an inch tall. Um, and just look windswept. I mean, just imagine that this is flying over a forest or something and you're looking at windswept forests. Well, but it's not. It's down amongst your feet. Um, here, <laughs> a completely different kind of form of uh, probably a, a moss, I believe. Uh, Dr. Gray, if you're listening, you can correct me. But here, uh, a very meatier, thicker, uh, voluptuous moss. Uh, the streams coming down to this area, this glacial valley, down here is where the glacier has passed, carving out these sides right here. 
um, and beautiful different kinds of, uh, I don't know, lichen that are growing. This almost looks initially like somebody spray painted it, but it's not. It's natural orange. It's growing on some of these rocks. All right, now the story of Franz Joseph Glacier. And this is a story about global warming. Global warming. The glacier itself used to come really far out. You didn't have to hike in if you were there 150 years ago. But it's retreated <clears throat> with the industrialization, the burning of fossil fuels, the warming of the climate. Uh, we think that's contributed to the retreat of this and many glaciers all over the world. So in the 1930s now, we start getting a glacial lake that we can see down here below. Here's our 1950, 1965. Um, here's 2010, the extent of the glacier. Notice this point right here. So this would be the glacier going up the valley here. Focus on that point. That's the same point. There's no glacier here. The glacier is way up here at this point. Let me go back. That's 2010. Nine years later. See? Nine years later. It's retreated. 2008 versus 2012 in four years. These are trail maps put there at different spots where the glacier used to be. And it used to be that tourists, and this is one of the top tourist destinations in all of New Zealand, it used to be that the tourists would come up and see the glacier, the blue colored ice. This is 2019. This is from that point that I showed you. It's quite a picture actually. It's a really quite a sense of scale. Uh, the glacier is way tucked up here. This is Sentinel Point now. There's the little bump right here, really looking at the glacial valley. So this whole thing has been eroded away by glaciers. So this is some of the sand, the glacial till, and, and then the stream that's the meltwater of the glacier coming out over here. Here's the area that you have to hike. So we've already hiked for about 10 minutes to get to here. This is the trail. These are actually people over here, close to us. You have to hike way over here. So this is the problem of the small town of Franz Joseph Glacier. This is their tourist attraction. And it's melting away. This glacier is retreating now so far that most tourists are going to be unwilling to make the hike to see the glacier. It has retreated so far. I'm just showing a bit of the hike. We thought, you know, you never know how long it's going to be for a hike and to do certain things. I thought that this was going to be a real quick day kind of thing, that maybe in two hours you hike the glacier and back. But I think we spent uh, closer to three or four hours. We spent more time and looked at things. <clears throat> Here's the valley, the glacial valley. This is the string of people on the trail making their way, and you can see how much farther they have to go to get anywhere you, where you could even see much of the base of the glacier. Here's the trail again, and you have to cross, of course, some of these streams that are coming out, and rocks have been located there so that people can walk there. Um, there aren't any stands selling you ice cream or t-shirts. No, this is all a park. Uh, but they have fixed up the trails and they come in with heavy equipment to make it so that you can hike through this region. Here's Amy on some of the stepping stones. So, uh, you know, the weather was pretty good. Probably in the 60s, it's a cool area. And we're making our way up. This is one of the signs that's helping you to understand what's going on. And so here you can read it, but I'll show you it closer up in just a second. In 2009, the glacier ended here. That's what the sign says. Now, 10 years later, and the glacier's way back up there. That's the sign. What are they showing you? A few interpretations here. Uh, the population changed from 2009 to 2016, probably when they put it up. Here's parts per million for CO2. Here's global temperatures uh, that are continuing to go up. 
You can read the sign in detail and pause this if you'd like. This is the hump that's right up at the terminus of the trail. This is as close as you get to the glacier. That's it. There's the fence right there. Somebody took the picture for us. Goofy looking me and, and beautiful Amy right here. Um, and there's the glacier. But that's as close as you can get. This is a glacier people used to walk on. Tourists would stop. So we talked to the owner of one of the places we stayed there. And we said, you know, what's going on? She said, you know, she said, I was part of a focus group that was thinking through what can we do? And they were thinking about having a tram or a rail system or something that now can traverse this distance so people can get in and finally look at the retreating glacier. Because this is the reason why you stay in Franz Josef Glacier. And there's all sorts of little shops there in this town. It's a tourist town of how the people make a living. There's helicopter trips, of course, that's really common. You get in these kind of places near the glaciers and um, just about everybody wants to take you up on a helicopter and it's about a 15 minute adventure for about $300, two to $300. Uh, they make it up and that would be your chance to get on top of the glacier. The other way to get on top of the glacier and to hike it, you have to go in with guides. And so you have to pay more money and go this good distance. So it's a tourist problem. It, you know, you never really think about that kind of aspect of global warming. But here, the touristy things you were treating. Here we were then at the end of the place close to the glacier, and I'm looking back down the trail and hoping you to see this valley carved by the glacier. And of course, where we live in Illinois is a highly glaciated region, so these kinds of forces are very relevant to life in North America. It's one of the many reasons why I've been traveling to these kinds of locations uh, Alaska, Iceland, and now here in New Zealand, because this is relevant to the changing landscape where we live and the changing landscape that life must respond to as it evolves. So we spent so much time at Franz Josef Glacier, we didn't have time to stop at Fox Glacier, which is much the same story. Uh, now we're going to take off and make our whole day trip getting our way to Queenston. And this was just a beautiful day. It was a chance to be up in the mountains, winding your way through the mountains, and stopping and, and just seeing some beautiful landscapes. So um, our next day was to go up through this region and make our way to Queenston, about here. By the way, the other problem, because they don't have enough problems at Franz Joseph, is that it's, because it is on that fault line, it's a place with a lot of earthquakes. And when geologists have come in and looked at this, they said it's very likely that there's going to be a disastrous earthquake that will unleash a lot of water um, from the glacier and, and potentially wipe out the town of Franz Joseph Glacier. So the people are losing their um, really draw for tourism, and they're also endangered living there. One of the things that New Zealand considered was moving the entire town. But as you can imagine, uh, that was not something that was financially possible. All right, a little uh, farther back in history. Here, here's a little quick plate tectonic lesson. So if we go back about 250 million years ago, and remember that the age of the Earth is about 4.6 billion years ago. So 250 goodness gracious, um, it's uh, you know, about a 20th of Earth's history right here. 250 million years ago, we have Pangaea. And Pangaea breaks up here somewhat representing the land masses, that, the plates that we can recognize today. So Africa, South America, North America, Europe, um, India, Australia, <clears throat> yeah, Antarctica. In any case, Pangaea breaks up, and so what you get is a distinction between Laurasia and Gondwana land. And I mention the Gondwana land because at this point where we're at in New Zealand, I saw an interpretive map and they said that in fact this part of New Zealand is probably the best representation of what it would be like to be in this 
zone of Gondwana land. It has been uninterrupted, the landscapes of southern New Zealand where we were at. Uh, they said, it, you know, it's just like going back 200 million years into Gondwana land. And I wanted you to understand what Gondwana land is. Here now we can follow the story a further breakup then of Laurasia and Gondwana land and giving us most of the plates we have today. This is India, uh, which is a very active plate, and it very quickly in 65 million years is like, as I joke about it, like a, a kid who's uh, not driving very safely and just comes up and crashes into Asia right here. And so what do you get at the interface of India and Asia? You get the Himalayan mountains right here. Um, so here's India now after it's crashed into Asia and it's continuing to crash. And so the Himalayas continue to rise. So here's Australia and now finally New Zealand as it pieces back together in our story. <clears throat> so here we were and the interpretive sign said we were about to leave the, the coast and go inland across the mountains. And the sign said uh, when you take a look now farther south, so in this direction, they said, just imagine Gondwana land, that you've gone back in a time machine. And as I looked there, I just could see it. I, I mean, it just really struck me, and I got a little teary-eyed. Um, I also, it was windy, so maybe I was just teary-eyed from that. But uh, they, they said there were sea, uh, elephant seals that were down here on this beach. And here's the beach, and good luck seeing the elephant seals. Um, but there are things that are out of the water, and they might have been down here. But this was not a place where you could take a road down to it. And so it was a nice protected area that I think was doing pretty well. But this, this could be a scene right here out of Gondwana land. Uh, there's no sign of humans. Uh, and you could be back 200 million years ago. And I thought that was neat. Well, here we're driving along. And as lots of mountain roads do, uh, they drive along water systems because they tend to be pretty level. Uh, here, uh, again, first day of summer or so. It's actually about a week into the summer there. Uh, so this is first week of January of 2020. And we've got some snow caps to some of the mountains that we're going through. But a lot of mountain streams. Uh, for those of you that know about mountain streams associated with glaciers, there is very, very finely ground rock that the glacier has been grinding down until it's just uh, called, it's called glacial flower like flour that you make bread out of. And that flour suspends in the waterways and it gives a milky appearance to the water. And so that's one of the clues when you see water like this that you know it's an outflow of a glacier because it's got that glacial flour suspended within the water. But these are just some of the beautiful spots that we'd stop, maybe have a snack. And this is what you get to do when you take these kinds of trips and you got a car. Um, just gorgeous. Just gorgeous, awe-inspiring kinds of places. Uh, this is kind of like a picture that we took in Iceland um, when you get to see this kind of thing. And just looking at this picture, um, of course, these mountains are at a distance, so they look a little faded. And the whole thing just looks fake. Uh, it just looks like some kind of photographic backdrop, right, where people are taking pictures. Um, we stopped. I want to take a picture uh, and look later on at it. Uh, it was a very windy day, and someone else stopped, and as you normally are doing, lots of people do this, somebody else stops, and I offer to take their picture uh, with their camera and the background, and then they took our picture, and uh, remember, I said it was a really windy day, so uh, we have that wind-blown effect uh, here, but uh, here, I really wanted the picture taken in part to say, this isn't fake. This is really, truly what that landscape looked like. Um, this is a lake in the southern part that we stopped at. Um, the shoreline is a little campground, uh, a glacial high altitude lake, uh, very cold. Uh, we have a couple rocks that we picked up from here. It was just a very inspiring mountain area uh, to see. Uh, here are the other direction looking north on these mountains. And this one in particular really caught my attention. I've gone on to Google Maps and tried to locate it and get whatever view I can. Uh, but this is all, all volcanic. And this looks very much like the plume of the molten rock that's moving up into the top of the volcano. And that this side of this mountain has cleaved away. 
um, when we've gone on geology courses. So in 2018, Amy and I took some field geology courses on volcanoes in Northern California and Oregon. And we've looked at the internal structure of these magma flows. And there's often these little side branches so that magma will come up on the sides of a volcano. There's kinds of volcanoes where it's not just out the top, but it kind of oozes through the side. And I think that's what you're seeing here. And I'm, I'm very excited and I could be completely full of it. And this has nothing to do with what I've just told you. Um, but I, I think it is. And I'm looking forward to seeing a geologist sometime to see if they think that I'm on the right track. Um, on our way to Queenston, which was our last road stop before we made it to Dunedin in the meeting. Um, here we pulled over because if you know these flowers, you know that they're lupines or lupins, as some people call them. Um, lupins are not native to New Zealand. Uh, if you remember at all, that'd be amazing. My Iceland talk everywhere around Iceland the, uh, at the same time of the year. Uh, we saw that is the same corresponding season we saw lupins everywhere, giant fields. And what's happened is, is that these are similar kinds of highly eroded um, volcanic regions. And the lupins do really well in these cool, moist environments. They planted lupins all around Iceland to try to keep the soil in place and not so much dust. Maybe that's worked, maybe not. That's an introduced species. And here they've introduced them to New Zealand. So they're pretty as can be and they go nicely with Amy's attire today, <laughs> um, but they aren't native. So here we are descending the valleys to make our way to Queenston. This is just outside of Queenston. There's a, a lake, which is Queenston all around. And uh, for us, it was a very uh, settled area with an airport and people living all over and a very much domesticated landscape, a big highway going through, and it was a little disappointing for us. We got there and we stayed at a very nice bed and breakfast, here a little tiny balcony where I could look out and take a picture really of most of the places where people were staying. Um, we went downtown, uh, and so this is downtown here, we had to descend a bit. Uh, an awful lot of shops that catered to people who were backpacking, so bicycle repair shops or supply shops, and then really, really nice restaurants. Um, and so it was very much uh, um, reminded me of the Northern Canadian Rockies, if anybody's been to Banff and Jasper. But those are towns that I knew, at least in the 1970s, as places where they were a resupply headquarters. There were people were backpacking that would stop in. So there's an awful lot of, um, I mean this in the nicest way, hippie-like people were backpacking and they're just trying to, you know, they're hiking, they're hiking clothes and they probably need to take a shower. And by the hundreds, the people were congregated in the town and I'm sure they were catching up and comparing notes and, and exchanging good ideas for places to go. And it, it was fun, I, it had a feeling of the 1960s and the 1970s. Now, I want to end this third of four segments by talking about our adventures once we get to Dunedin. And the day before the formal World Congress begins, we signed up for a very special field trip. And this was a field trip, an all-day field trip, with a couple researchers. Um, they weren't professors. They worked for the Department of Conservation. And these were the, pro the protected area for the, the two very endangered species of lizard, skinks. So here's some maps. This is the southern island again, southern and northern island. Here's the southern island. And as you'll see here, this is the historical distribution of these skinks. Well, they were all over the place. The dotted line is now where we find them today. And Dunedin is right down here. So I'm moving the arrow a little bit so you can see. And these protected areas are right over here. And McRae's Flat is something I, I mentioned in the first episode here in which it's a protected area. And, and so our field trip was with the two researchers who are in charge of this McRae's Flat. <clears throat> and here we are inside the protected area to show you some geckos that live inside this McRae's flat. 
It, remember, this is actually a protected area for two skinks, but there's geckos and there are other skinks that are in the area. So here the researchers can pick them up. But this is a study area. Now, in this study area, I mentioned that there are some fenced zones. And sometimes there are small fenced areas. This almost brings tear to my, tears to my eyes when I think this is what we have to do to protect part of the world from what we're doing to it. This is, we can't like put a fence around and go, well, at least we'll preserve this part. And it, it just, oh, it just makes me so sad. Well, in this area of McRae's flat, they've created some small fenced zones. And there's a big one that I'll show you that we got to go inside. And then they've also, so inside the fence zones, they remove the invasive species. But their other strategy that they're trying is instead of putting up these very expensive fences, what if they create trails, trap lines, and go out and monitor every day and try to catch all the invasive species they can? Of course, they're killing them. And so can we go out and trap and kill and have just the same effect? And their research in the last 10 years is showing that, yeah, actually, you don't have to put a fence around it. You can just lay out these, and I'll show you a map of it, extensive trap lines and a couple people, full-time jobs, are running these trap lines and killing the things that are in the traps. And that includes cats and these brush-tailed possums and hedgehogs and the stuff that I showed you the data. So I'll show you that again. <clears throat> so here's yet another fenced area in which we're protecting some of these rocky outcroppings where the lizards live. And then this is the, the great big one. And so here you can see the fencing. We were walking along the outside until we got to a gate. I'll show you right here. So you go into the gate, close the door, then you go to the inside. <clears throat> you make sure that your backpacks don't have mice or anything in them. And that seems really weird, but you could have set your backpack down with your lunch in it and a mouse could climb inside and you didn't know it. Uh, lizards could also climb inside that don't belong there or other critters. And so we have to inspect our backpacks and sometimes a mouse does come out, it turns out. Here, just to show you more of the characteristics of the fence, here's the size of the fence. And it's one other opportunity to feel really bad for me and my broken fingertip right here. So if you'd like to have a little bit of sympathy, but also notice the fingernails are looking pretty nice right here. So I did okay there. Um, <laughs> here I'm in the field, I'm, I'm just thinking that isn't too bad. Um, uh, so here we are going through the gate, and now we're inside the enclosure there. Well, I hadn't mentioned to you yet, how are you getting rid of all these invasive species? And the answer is that they're doing something that won't work very well here in the United States. In addition to traps, uh, they're usually live traps, they're not leg traps, live traps, and then they come along, so the, the, the big traps with their catching cats, I said, okay, so they're live. Yeah, the cat's live inside. And then I said, then what do you do? Well, they carry a pistol and they shoot the cat. And then they have to have a big hole where they put all these bodies. Uh, but these things have just taken over. The cats don't belong there. In any case, one of the other things on islands like, on the first episode, Rangitoto and Tiritiri, the way they got rid of most of the invasive species is with poison baits. And these are things that are toxic to people. And so that's why I took a picture of this sign warning you that, look, uh, we put these baits out. <clears throat> they look pretty peculiar. You, you aren't to bring, of course, your dogs or pets around to the area that might eat the bait. And you have to watch kids and make sure they aren't picking it up and realize that this is pretty serious stuff. Now, they put it sometimes in carrots. Um, and actually, I learned that when they're doing the baiting, first they just distribute carrots, probably in these little carrots. Um, and they're not baited. They just distribute carrots. And the animals start learning to eat the carrots in the area. And then they drop in the poison ones. Well, in, in islands, then you'd have a bunch of dead poisoned mammals. And for those of you that are my students, think this through. Why would that be a problem? Why would it be a problem in Illinois if you had a bunch of dead poisoned animals like rats or mice? The answer is there are things that are going to eat mice and rats. They might be birds of prey. They might be snakes. Uh, could be pets just as well. Cats and dogs are people that run around. 
And that's the problem. When they did poison on islands, Rangitoto, Tiraturi, and other islands, especially in the far north of New Zealand, that are these preserves now, they did have some hawks that came in uh, that did get poisoned, and they died. But it turned out that those hawks were wildly abundant, and the populations of the hawks weren't severely damaged. And nothing is perfect. This is biology. And so that was uh, one of the bad effects. Right now, there's lots of controversy in New Zealand. I got to meet and talk with these conservation people, and they believe that this is a safe strategy. But there are other people that are quite worried about this, and we're spreading information. And actually, it was a bit of a conspiracy theory stuff that I was hearing from, from one person who was local who was against this. Um, but from the conservation side of things, you know, uh, humans created these invasive, uh, allowed these invasive species to be here in New Zealand, and we have to do something. Here is a map <clears throat> that's showing you these dotted lines are the trap trails. So every dot is a trap, and of course it's numbered here, and someone has to go out and walk these trails and empty the traps every day. That's the humane thing to do, right? You wouldn't want a, a mammal to be stuck in a trap all day without water and then to be suffer, suffering like that. And then they go out and humanely uh, kill it. And that's usually violent. If you have been in my classes before, we've talked about that. Um, there's humane ways to kill animals. And uh, often it's very sudden and violent, uh, but it's a, a pretty painless, I mean, it's a fast way to die. It's probably painful, but for a fraction of a second. Uh, in any case, this trapping strategy, eliminating animals by trapping, has been just as effective as building these giant, very expensive enclosures. Um, I think that's kind of interesting. So this is the data that I showed you at the very, very beginning. And this data applies right there to McRae's flat. That's where this came from. So I got this data and I got this paper from James Reardon. He was the, the first lead author right here, was our guide. So the person who was holding the gecko and the skink in the picture was Dr. James Reardon. And he wanted us to have this uh, before we went on the field trip so we could be well informed. Uh, but you can see that this is the kind of trapping that goes on. Just a tremendous number of hedgehogs and also a, just a continuing number of cats. <clears throat> well, inside the enclosure, these are the kinds of rocky outcroppings that are habitat for these endangered skinks. And I mentioned to you before that the skinks like to live under the ledges so that birds of prey can't see them, and that's the normal predator. Um, rabbits have also been introduced into this region, by the way. Um, and so it's really interesting as you go, and as we went across New Zealand, there are places where just where we were, we couldn't believe it. There were over a hundred rabbits just running around. And if you looked up in the sky, there were probably 10 hawks. And it was just this amazing thing, of all these rabbits and all these hawks. Well, the hawks might also eat the skinks. So it's a complicated ecosystem in which now you have more predators for the skinks, but the predators have something that's even more nutritious to eat. Uh, and at least the skinks naturally can get out of sight, but not for other introduced species that hunt by smell. So we went around and tried to spot some of these skinks, and it was near the end. We spotted several of them, but at the very, very end, uh, the, Dr. Reardon allowed us to go into one of the very special places where he was pretty sure we'd see them. And lo and behold, both species, adults, were next to each other. And this is a photo I took, very close, of two of these endangered skinks. And so here's a close-up that I cropped to allow you to see these two endangered skinks. Um, and there just are not a lot of them. Here you can see the patterns, the color patterns are quite different. Um, and these things, so if you had a ruler, a regular one-foot ruler, uh, these are longer than a one-foot ruler. So they're pretty big, long animals. Also near this spot is the, I think, the largest gold mine in all of New Zealand. And I think I checked, I believe that the value of the gold that they pulled out of this mine, maybe in 2018, 
was about $250 million worth of gold. And so, like a lot of things, uh, the gold mine owned a lot of this land, and so they allowed the preserve right near the gold mine, McCray's Flat, um, to be developed. And so there's a synergy. While we were at the World Congress meeting, uh, representatives from this gold mine showed up and were talking about the conservation efforts that they were making. Here on the bus ride back from McCray's Flat, back to Dunedin, I took some pictures out the bus window just to show you the kind of landscape. It's just really a special place. You got to kind of look at this picture because I, 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 my eye is first drawn here and then I come down and go, wait a minute. And then you see the side of this forest. Really interesting. All right, we're ready uh, for the fourth and final episode, and that will be at our time in Dunedin and at the meeting. Thanks for bearing with us.